will sing out hallelujah and we will cry out. Uh, before we uh, begin and do our our um, traditional discussion questions around the table I uh, I want I have a visual uh, for you so that you can kind of get a picture of some of these things. Today we're going to talk about the sacrifice of, of Isaac, or really the passage is, is about the testing of Abraham. But we'll talk about the sacrifice of Isaac because uh, it's, it's not uncommon in the days of Abraham. It becomes more common later on. But it's not uncommon just to the Middle East. Around the world there have been all kinds of places that did human sacrifice. In fact, I brought my visual aid with me. Sacrificial knife from uh, the Aztecs. <laughs> Still got blood on it right now. No, I'm just kidding. Take a look at that. Pass that around. That's a sacrificial knife from the Aztecs. <laughs> <laughs> Is it real? No. That's a tourist thing. There are no Aztecs today. They went the way of all of those who do human sacrifices. They disappear. <laughs> During the time of, just before uh, Columbus and all of the Spaniards came out, uh, they did a four-day sacrifice in the in the the capital of the Aztecs, four-day sacrifice, 80,000 people were sacrificed on their altars. 24 hours a day, four priests cutting people's heads off and slashing and stabbing. So human sacrifice is something that happened all around the world. Okay, so I have two questions for the discussions around the table. So if they can put those up there, we'll take a look at our two questions. There. First is, uh, what has been the most difficult thing that God has ever asked you to do or has asked of you? And the second is, the three voices we can hear from are ourselves, God, or the devil. So the question is, how do you know the difference? How can you tell the difference when God is speaking to you? How do you know that it's God that's speaking to you? And we've got... Uh, I got to set up here for seven minutes, 23 seconds. <laughs> yeah, so, so you got seven minutes, 23 seconds. Let's see what happened to it. My clock. There it is. Go. The testing of Abraham or uh, the uh, sacrifice of Isaac. Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 19. Verses 1 and 2 say this. Sometime later, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. The last time I was, I was privileged to, to preach here for you guys uh, was about the birth of Isaac. And uh, so somebody had prayed that I would be able to uh, use my uh, sense of humor in that message. And, and that's not too difficult because Isaac means laughter. And I think that that very name given by God is kind of in jest to remind them that Sarah laughed, Abraham laughed, and then I think that it also points to the fact that God has a sense of humor. And one of the things that uh, makes us in the image of God is that we have a sense of humor. And you might think, okay, what about the uh, laughing hyena? Uh, no, the laughing hyena does not laugh. Tell it a good knock-knock joke, it will not get it. In fact, most of you will not get it. No, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, some people do have a, a much 
a better sense of humor than others. However, in this passage of Scripture, I find it really difficult to find anything humorous about it. Now think about this. Though this is only 19 verses long, it is the most written about event in Hebrew literature. It's perplexing. It's not just perplexing. It's horrific. It's a terrible request that God is making. It's unthinkable. Uh, it doesn't sound like anything that God would possibly require of his servants. In fact, it's offensive to the heart and mind of any parent to think that God would ask them to sacrifice their child in a burnt offering. My immediate reaction would be, no, absolutely not. That's unthinkable. I couldn't do that. Abraham spent most of his life, or most of his adult life, following God. And he was called a friend of God. And I can uh, imagine how, I can't imagine how Abraham could deal with such a requirement from God. It's really unthinkable, unimaginable. So in the second question that we had up there, we won't go back to it, but the second question, uh, the three voices we hear coming from heaven or from uh, within ourselves is the self, God, and the devil. How do we know the difference? Did anybody answer that question on the table? Get to that where you answer the question. How do you know the difference between the word of God coming to you and the other guy trying to deceive you? Jesus? Well, how do you know it's Jesus? This has always been a perplexing question for me. And think about in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul said to the, to the Thessalonians, uh, he said, I wanted to come to you, but Satan hindered me. And in another place, he said, we would have come to you, but the Holy Spirit hindered us. Well, how did Paul know the difference? You tested against the word. Oh, that's very good. And did your table come up with that? Or is that something that you just... They, they, all, they all help with that? That's right. It's all you. It's all you. That's exactly right, though. That's exactly right. <laughs> Yay! Uh, that's exactly right. You test it against God's word. If it's contrary to God's word, that is not God speaking to you. Uh, but really, in fact, I am uh, skeptical when I hear people say that they heard an external audible voice speaking to them from God. I'm skeptical, but don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that God can't speak to us in an external audible voice. I'm just saying that I'm skeptical about it because you have one, one out of three chances that it's, that it's not God. I mean, two out of three chances that it's not God. And I would be even more skeptical if that voice was telling me to do something that was contrary to the Word of God. Uh, although there is a theory presented by a, a philosopher, a 13th century philosopher by the name of William of Ockham. You, maybe you've heard of Ockham's razor. Well, William of Ockham also said, whatever God wills must be done simply because he said so. Anybody agree with that? Yeah, that sounds good. But then he goes on to say, if God had wanted, he could have ordered men to obey the opposite of the Ten Commandments. Even now, he could rescind those laws and will their opposites. Absolutely not. Why not? God can't lie. Well, you know, what if he says, okay, today I'm going to start lying. Isn't he God? Isn't he omnipotent, uh, omniscient, and all the omnis? Could God just rescind the Ten Commandments and say, okay, today we're going to start sacrificing our children? Huh? What are you saying? Yeah, please no. <laughs> 
you're right. He can't do that because the commandments of God are based upon his character. It's not something external to God. It's his character that says, thou shalt not kill. Uh, see, this idea of William of Ockham is a very dangerous idea, though. So even if you do hear some sort of external voice telling you to do something that's contrary to the word of God, I have two words for you. Get help. If you hear a voice telling you that's, uh, something that's contrary to the word of God, you need to get help. Talk to one of the elders here or go see a psychiatrist because you need long-term therapy. Personally, though, I think it would be great to hear an external, audible voice booming from heaven to tell me what to do. That would be dynamite. Every year, I am part of an ongoing UCSD Medical Center study on healthy aging. They're going to track my aging until I die, right? So every year, they pay me $50 to fill out a 40-page uh, questionnaire, and then $25 to go in and uh, do a uh, psychological evaluation. I know, that's where, that's where it starts to get a little fuzzy. They ask all kinds of funny questions. They ask, like, for example, count backwards from 100 to zero by sevens. The woman says, count backwards by uh, one hundred by sevens. Go 197. And I go, wait a minute. You just said the two that I know. I mean, now, yeah, I, can't, I don't even know those. <laughs> 93. How, I, can, I can pass that. Uh, but I, I've got to figure it out, though. What I'm going to do the next time, next year, when it, when it uh, comes around, when they ask me this question, they ask me this question. Have you ever heard voices speaking to you? I've got an answer. This, this year I figured out I've got an answer. I say, as a matter of fact... I have heard the voice of God speaking to me. And as they uh, fit me for the straight jacket and try to haul me off to the padded room, I'm going to tell her, no, wait a minute. I'm just kidding. That was actually my GPS. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great, though, to have a, a divine GPS to tell us what to do? You know, head south on Magnolia Avenue. In 300 feet, turn right. That would be great to hear that from God, the, the, uh, the divine GPS. But God just simply doesn't work that way, I don't think, today. So, especially if he tells you to do the wrong thing. So the question is, how do we determine if God is speaking or is the other guy? By the word of God. The Bible is our benchmark we can say, if it's a, a contrary to the Bible, it's not God. But see, Abraham didn't have the Bible. He knew God so much that the Bible calls him the friend of God. And so, Abraham uh, knew it was wrong to kill his son. Yet, as far as we know, he didn't hesitate to follow the command of God. He just set out to do it. He didn't even question God. Now, it's true that Abraham didn't always get it right. You know, we've talked about Abraham now for several weeks in, the, in our uh, messages through uh, Genesis. And it's true that Abraham didn't get it right all the time. I mean, he left the promised land to go down into Egypt. He told a little white lie about his wife twice. And uh, uh, he had a child by his wife's maid. So he didn't always get it right. But the Bible says about him that he never wavered in unbelief at God's promise, but was strengthened in his faith. Now, how could it say that he never wavered if he did all these wrong things? Well, I think 
That is, the Apostle Paul was telling us that Abraham, though he had done some pretty dumb things, and though he had sinned against God on, on occasions, he never gave up and went back to Haran. He never said, well, this isn't working. I'm never going to get this land, so I'm going home. He never gave up. Of all the dumb, stupid things he did, Abraham never returned to his old life. In fact, he didn't even let Isaac go back to Haran to get his own wife. Once you become a Christian, never return to your old life. I have an anecdote about that. Do you want to hear it? <laughs> Say, let's hear it, Brother Mike. Let's hear it, Brother Mike. <laughs> okay, okay, since you asked, I'll tell you. Shortly after I became a Christian, uh, a friend of mine came to me, and he, he, said, uh, he, he said, Mike, I'm, I'm collecting some money. We're having a party. I want you to come to the party. It's uh, $20 a piece to come to this party. He was inviting 200 people. To, and he was collecting the $20 to buy drugs and alcohol. Now, $4,000 would buy a lot of drugs in those days, right? <laughs> and so, so uh, I had just become a Christian, and uh, I could still see the expression on his face, and I could still hear the tone of his voice when he said this to me. He said, ah, oh, come on, Mike. Can't you just be your old self? One more time. And yeah, I kind of wanted to go to the party. But I told him, I, I, you know, God intervened, I'm sure. Because I told him, my old self is dead. I've been crucified with Christ. I can't go back to my old self. Well, shortly after that, when I encountered him, I read an article in the Daily Californian that's, that said there was a huge drug bust in Lakeside. Uh, and they raided this party, about 200 people in it. And they listed the names of 20 people that they had arrested uh, at this party in the paper. And I can't help think, had I just said, okay, I'll just be my old self one more time if my name wouldn't have been on that list. You know, I get down on my bum knee and praise God, the God Almighty, for rescuing me and saving my wicked soul. So I'm glad that God rescued me from all of that. See, I'm not saying I haven't messed up, though. Uh, I'm not saying I haven't rebelled or been sinful. I can tell you this, I've grieved God with my sins throughout my life. But by the grace of God, I will never go back to that old self. That self is dead. And verse 2 in our passage of Scripture says, Then God said, Take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there, as a burnt offering on the mountain, I will show you. Now, I could talk about this particular passage, this particular verse, all day long. But I'm only going to make two observations for you today. The first is that child sacrifice uh, did occur in Abraham's day, but it became more prevalent later on when Molech and Ashtaroth, those two uh, deities appeared in the Middle East and grew throughout the region. Um, I think it was the, 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 the reason for the sacrificing of children. You ever think, what were they, how was that supposed to work? You sacrifice a child and how, what was that supposed to do for you? The reason why people would sacrifice a child was to procure favor from the gods and find fortune, happiness, and prosperity. I find that today, our society does a lot of the similar things. 
and we, you know, sacrifice our children to the government. And say, ah, the government's going to buy them breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Because we're both working. My wife and I are both working. We're busy building our careers. So we're going to sacrifice our children for that. And we sacrifice our children. You know, the number one reason why women, young women, have abortions in our society is that a baby, because they're told that a baby would hamper their good fortune, their happiness, and their prosperity. And that, I think, goes in the no-duh file. Everybody who has had children knows this. They hamper your life a bit. <laughs> Sometimes a, a bit more than a bit. Yet, yet it's been my observation... Uh, th through the past, it's been my observation that actually abortion does the exactly opposite. It does hamper a woman's happiness and well-being for decades to come. Some of you know that I was pastor of a church for about 15 years, a couple of churches, and in that time, several, a couple of dozen women have come to my office and whipped, wept bitter tears in regret and shame and guilt because they had an abortion when they were young. Some of them could no longer have children. Uh, but you know what? I have never had one single mom come to me and say, I regret having my child with that kind of depth of grief. Now, I don't mean to be insensitive here. You know, some people say that I have a spiritual gift for being insensitive. <laughs> so, so I don't mean to be insensitive. So if you or somebody you love has had an abortion, I have one thing to say to you. God loves you. God loves you. And he wants to forgive you. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's our job to confess. It's his job to cleanse us and forgive us. My second observation is that God called Isaac... Abraham's only son. But wait a minute, wait a minute. Abraham had another son. Ishmael. The term only son refers to the heir, to the father's possessions. And in the Bible, it also refers to the heir to the promises of God. God promised Abraham land, seed, and blessing, and that would go as an inheritance, not to Ishmael, but to Isaac. And the term took on even greater meaning in the days of the New Testament, when Jesus is called the only begotten Son, or the only unique Son of God. In Roman days, uh, the, the Roman law said that a man would choose, on his deathbed, he would choose who he wanted to be his heir. And most of the fathers would adopt their firstborn son and give him that inheritance. But sometimes, occasionally, he would go to somebody else, either a, somebody, one of his servants in the house, or another son that he has. That person who inherited the estate would be designated the only unique son. So when we read 1 John 4, 9, the scripture says, This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his, only, his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. See, Jesus is the only unique Son of God. But it gets even better. We are adopted as sons and daughters, according to the promise. We are 
joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We get to inherit. But it gets even still better. In the New Testament, five times the Apostle Paul talks about adoption. That we have been adopted. Now in those days, now hear this. In those days, if you were a natural son, you could be cut off from the inheritance. But if you were adopted as a son, you could never be cut off from that inheritance. Can you picture Jesus on the cross at Calvary? He pushes himself up from the cross so he gets a full breath of air. He says, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God cut off his only unique son so that you and I could be adopted as his son and daughter. And you know what? You can never be cut off from that inheritance. Isn't that great? <laughs> Amen. You can never be cut off from that inheritance. Uh, in fact, that's why the scripture says that Jesus says, I will never leave you or forsake you. In fact, in the uh, uh, New Testament, you find this in book, the book of Romans. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor heights, nor depths, nor any other creation shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Yay. Amen? <laughs> Nothing can separate you from the love of God because... You have been adopted as a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Now we're going to move faster through the rest of this passage of Scripture. Genesis chapter 22, verse 3 through 5. Uh, he said to his servant, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there, and we will worship, and then we will come back to you. I believe that since God designated Isaac as Abraham's only son or heir to the promises, that Abraham knew that somehow God would give him back his son. Even if he was to sacrifice his son, somehow God would give him back his son. He just had to be willing to let go of the son he loved. However, I don't think Isaac was quite as convinced. You can almost hear the tone of his voice in verses 7 and 8 when he says, The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but uh, where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God will provide a lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on their way. Centuries later, so what happens? You know what happens after this. Uh, Abraham reaches up with the knife to cut his son and burn him on the altar. And the angel of the Lord stops him. He says, now I know that you would not withhold your son from me. And Abraham looks up and he sees a ram. And he sacrifices the ram. But Abraham had said prophetically that God would provide lamb. So generations pass and generations pass and generations pass. And one day John the Baptist is standing in the river Jordan. And he sees Jesus coming up over the top of the hill. And he said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. First Peter 1 Peter 1.18 For you know that it was not with precious, perishable things such as silver and gold that we were redeemed, but 
by the precious blood of Christ, the Lamb, without blemish and defect. Jesus Christ is the promised Lamb of God. Even in the book of Revelation, the very end of the, the, the history, John sees out there the angel talking to him and, and, uh, and the elders are talking to him. And they say, Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah who is able to break the seals. And when John looks, what did he see? A lamb as though it had been slain. Jesus is the lamb of God. And as we prepare for our Lord's Supper, we are called upon to remember that Jesus shed his blood for us. The juice represents the blood. The bread represents his body that was broken for us. Jesus died on the cross to make a way that we could be joint heirs for eternity. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder thy power throughout the universe displayed then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great